Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our participants from North America, UK, South Africa, Lebanon, and Australia. Welcome to our fifth Rotaract session, a wine tour across the continents. No nasal swab, no masks, no sanitizing gel, and no temperature taking needed for this exotic trip that you will be embarking on from the comfort of your home. My name is Antoine Caldani. I'm the president of the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars, and I'm thrilled to welcome this evening a renowned wine consultant and the worldwide expert, my dear friend, Mr. Hadi Kahali. As most inspired ideas, the webinar of tonight was born around a glass of wine on a Zoom call with Hadi. We dreamt of a better world, one, one without politics, COVID-19, and economic crisis. A dream of elsewhere that we would like to share with you on this cultural and virtual voyage across some of the greatest vineyards. So no need to buckle your seat belts, pull your seats to their upright position, or raise your tablets. But before taking off, a few announcements regarding your carrier this evening, the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars, with our incoming president, Hagop Danzigian. Hagop, all yours. Well, thank you, President, uh, for this introduction. Our, what, basically, this, first of all, this, uh, today's webinar is in cooperation with MEREF, CCI France, Liban. It's the part of the French uh, Chamber of Commerce World War Network. Uh, the MEREF CCI France Liban has been committed to build and develop sustained prosperous Lebanese, Fr Lebanese French relationships by facilitating business connections, basically, uh, economic development and knowledge sharing to boost the success of both uh, the business communities. Uh, it's managed by the ESA Business School, and hopefully, when things will be a bit better, uh, we will hold a conference there when everything goes back to normal. I will, uh, I will take this opportunity to just uh, inform our audience that our next destinations on our Zoom flights. Uh, next week, we're going to be landing with Karim Daher. Karim Daher is a lawyer. He specialized in uh, commercial and uh, law taxation. He is very involved in the Lebanese fiscal uh, and commercial legislations. Uh, he is also the general uh, coordinator for the ALDIC. And what he is going to be speaking about is a very interesting point is what are the tools that we have in Lebanon to fight corruption? It's going to be in French and I'm sure it's going to be a very hot destination. The week after, uh, we're going to be welcoming uh, Walid Malouf on the 20. Walid Malouf, he's going to take us on a flight with the Lebanese food bank, whatever they're doing. I don't need to say more because really they're doing a very hard uh, work and it's going to be a super nice uh, meeting, I hope. That's going to be on the 20. Back at you, uh, Monsieur le Consul, actually. Uh, ladies and gents, dear friends of the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars, thank you once again for your online presence with us tonight. As usual, let me start with a quick word about the technical side. As you can see on your screen, you can use the chat window to share ideas or express opinions with other attendees. The Q&A session we will take place at the end of the lecture and you can ask your questions in the Q&A window, not in the chat window, please. If you find the question particularly interesting, please, lose, please use the little thumb and like it. This, was, this will allow, sorry, the question to go up in the list. We will, of course, ha ask the questions with the highest score first. Please note that all questions are allowed as long as they are wine related, of course. It doesn't have to be necessarily relate, uh, does, doesn't need to have a link with the presentation of today. For your information as well, a short poll, a short survey will be organized at the end of the lecture before the Q&A session. You can also reply on your screen. The results will be announced after the Q&A session. Enough technical talk, let's now focus on today's highlights. To help you get through these harsh times, the Rotary Club Beirut Cedars wanted to offer you a, a breath of fresh air. We will not try for once to address today's Lebanese original key issues. We will stimulate your taste for travel and gustatory pleasure 
Acres with one of the greatest wine specialists. Adi Kahale is a wine and FMCG specialist. FMCG stands for Fast Moving Consumer Goods and also a serial entrepreneur with many different hats, winemaker, wine estate manager, wine consultant and distribution professional. In 2006, while, while he was still the general manager of the number one alcoholic beverage distribution company in Lebanon, he opted for a career switch and decided to dedicate his life to his passion, wine. He then moved to Bordeaux and got a master's degree in enology and wine estates management in 2007 under the mentorship of Professor Denis Dubourdieu, one of the most famous winemakers and white wine academicians in the world. Two years later, he founded the Ixir Winery, a love project he ran for 10 years. Adi Kahale proudly runs the smallest winery in Lebanon called Atibaya, but he spends most of his time as a consultant for several wineries in Lebanon, but also in the whole Mediterranean region. He is the only Lebanese studying for the Master of Wine title and the diploma level of the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. He is an active member of the Lebanese Wine Association, the official body representing the wine sector in Lebanon. He holds an MBA from ESA ESCP and also a Bachelor of Science from LAU. Adi Kahale is a loving and proud husband and father, and during his free time, he likes traveling, hiking, biking, and diving as well. Ladies and gents, we are about to take off for a very pleasant and tasty trip. Mr. Kahale, thanks again for your support to our club's activities. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So, first of all, I would like to thank you all for such a generous introduction. I don't know if I deserve it. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for all these magnificent webinars you're doing. And thank you for giving me the opportunity today to talk about uh, something I'm passionate about, wine, especially after such distinguished guests uh, who, who preceded me here. So, why new world? When, when we're discussing with Tony on uh, what should we do, we, we kind of agreed on, on doing an escape, a great escape. But then we started thinking, will it be new world? Will it be Europe? And why did we choose new world? It's, it's very legitimate when you think that the thing about Europe, because when you think about Europe, you think wine. Europe has undoubtedly an exceptional tradition when it comes to making wine and perfecting the art of winemaking. However, the New World regions, and I will explain in detail what is the New World regions, have had a tremendous and profound impact on the wine world. Wine was being made in old Europe and shipped within Europe and outside Europe for years to every country in the world. Actually, wine was such an important commodity at one point in time in the 17th century that it represented 50% of, on everything being chipped in the world. And it was such an important commodity that we ended up using wine as a measure, as a unit, to measure the size of ships. So you may know this, but when you measure ships, you talk about tonnage, tonnage. Even till today, when you're talking about a very modern big ship, you talk about tonnage. And when you say this is a very big ship of 50,000 tonnage, that very simply means a ship that can carry 50,000 barrels of wine. So while old world was making wine, inventing AOC, Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, inventing everything we know about wine, Emigrants were, were leaving Europe and going to colonize the world. Those emigrants left their countries in pursuit of prosperity, sometimes fleeing injustice and sometimes also fleeing justice. They got to their destination, but always longing to their homeland. And what do you do when nostalgia hits you? As Lebanese, we know this very well when you go to other countries. You try to replicate your roots. So you start by recreating architecture, or at least trying to find familiar landscape. You give names that you know. New Orleans was named because it reminded them of Orléans. 
New Southampton, New South Wales were created. And just as a footnote, there are 47 towns in the states called Lebanon. So after they created cities and town, they tried to create the food. They had to use the ingredient they found or could grow with century old recipes. And this is why we got the best fusion food we can ever find. And then they got thirsty. So thirsty for what they drank back home and it was time to make wine. So contrary to what Tony said, let's buckle up and take a trip together around the new world wine regions. And let me start with this. Okay, so today we're going to visit the States, Argentina, South Africa, uh, Australia, then New Zealand. Definitely Chile would, should be on this, should be on this presentation, but just for time, for time purposes, I removed Chile. So what do we mean when you say a new versus old world? This is in wine terms. What you see in front of you, all the green, is what is considered in winemaking the new world of making wine. Whereas the old world is what you have in orange. It starts in Lebanon, it finishes up in Spain. Uh, and this is the old world. This is a new slide I got on the internet, and I was very surprised actually to find two new uh, additions to the new world, India and China. We won't, we won't cover these yet, but all the rest from the States up to New Zealand are what is meant by New World. And actually, although you see this green patch everywhere, it's not all the country that's making wine, very simply because wine, vine needs a certain climate. So actually it's small patches in those countries making wine. And if you ever wondered why we have just one, one line in the Northern Hemisphere and one line in the Southern Hemisphere making wine and all the rest is not. This is what we call the wine belt. The wine belt is, is simply those regions between two latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere and replicated in the Southern Hemisphere where is it possible to grow vines. Higher than that in the Northern Hemisphere, it's too cold lower it's lower it's too um, it's too it's too hot so always the winemaking has thrived into those into those two belts so something else to talk about old world and new world you know old world spent 500 years 600 years perfecting winemaking at one point they really attached the winemaking to the region so it became evident for them that if you talk about Bordeaux, it's going to be a certain style made of certain grape varieties. When you talk about Burgundy, it's going to be the same thing. Whereas when wine started in the New World, especially in the 19th and 20th century, it was very hard moving those people from this culture, sometimes a beer culture, to wine if wine was really going to be that complicated. Just remember yourself when you're in a restaurant, I think 90% of us when we get to a restaurant and we have a wine list in, a, in, in, a, in the restaurant, we are really intimidated. What does it mean? What does Poyac mean? What does Mersochar mean? I mean, some of us just, just order and a lot of time we have no clue what we're ordering. So the new world came and said enough. This is too complicated. We're not going to call the region, we're going to call the varietal. We're going to go for, do you like Cabernet Sauvignon, which is grape variety? Do you like Chardonnay? And once, once consumers start understanding that why they like Cabernet Sauvignon, they will always uh, ask for Cabernet Sauvignon. So the new world always stress on the varietal that you can see clear on the label, whereas the old world, still till today, I mean, with some exception, always talks about area, appellation d'origine contrôlée, and about the producer. I don't know if you see this yellow thing, generalization ahead. You, you cannot talk about wine, especially not when you try to cover five countries in one hour without generalization. 
there are exceptions, there are always exceptions, but in the big picture of things, what I'm going to say is true. So, in the wine world, when you say old world, usually you're talking about colder climates, where a new world, it's warmer climates. What does this do to the wine? When you have colder climates, you end up by having wine that with a lighter body, less alcohol, higher acidity. Just, just think about your fruit you're eating uh, from, a, from a cold country. It's going to be less ripe, it's going to be more acidic, and it's going to exhibit more earth, more profoundness. Whereas the new world, you're going to go for riper, higher alcoholic wines, less acidic, full-bodied and fruit-centered fruit centered wines. We, we, we sometimes say that New World wines are an explosion of fruit. The last thing is certain cliché linked to Old World and New World. When we say Old World, we think about tradition, Europe, history, and a kind of mentality that is, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Whereas in the New World, we think about technology, we think about science, we think about big companies, corporation handling wine, and a lot of, lot of intelligence in marketing. So if I wanna summarize all this, sometimes we think of old world wines as elegance and tradition. And up to the 60s, 70s, new world was kind of synonym to in your face wine, show off wine, not always very elegant. I had, on this, I had on this side the word vulgar, which I removed it, that was the cliche, and about technology. So all this was the cliche until one something, until something very important happened. What happened? Those two, those two persons, especially the guy on the right, is called James Purrier. So this guy was selling foreign wines in, uh, in Paris in the 60s and 70s, which was already something not very common. So we, he had the idea, he said, you know what? I think Californian wines are good. So let's do a competition. Let's do a competition between, uh, between American wines and French wines. But really, to make this really worthwhile, I'm going to get the best wines from France. So he got the best wines from Burgundy for the whites and the best red Bordeaux wines. And, and there were six wines from France and six wines from, from California. And just to make sure that no one is going to say, okay, the judges were biased. There were 11 judges and all were from France. And these were back then the best names you can find in the wine business. You had the sommelier of the Vifour, you had the sommelier of Taivon, you have the responsible of the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée Wine in France, you had Aubert de Vilaine, the still owner of, of Romane Conti, and all those people. And they invited, they invited the whole press. No one came because there's a very nice book written about this. And actually, there's a, a, a movie called Bottle Shop and I invite you to see it. It's a very nice movie, although it's 50% uh, romance. It's not totally the, the right story, but they invited all those uh, press journalists and no one came, very simply because they were all saying, okay, France is going to beat California in wine, so what are we going to report to? There's one guy from the Time magazine who at one point said, no, I'm not coming, but had something canceled on the last second, so he went. So this, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, tasting started, blind tasting, and there was like a silence at one, at one moment because the French judge were kind of sure they're going to recognize the French wines, and they didn't. And one hour later, there were the results for the white, and the first wine was Montalena from California. So the guy from Time started writing the article. He said, okay, something just happened here. And it seems that for those who were present at this tasting, the French judge were saying, okay, we can't let this happen. No, 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 ça peut pas arriver. It cannot happen with the red. And they had the blind tasting again, 
One hour later, the result came. And it was Tag Leaps from, from California who won. That was the turnaround of the new world. This is when the world discovered that there are wines being made out of France, out of Europe, that can be very good. Actually, those two are the wines that won. And for those of, for those of you who know the Smithsonian Wine Museum, not uh, History Museum, in the States, these are two very important uh, pieces in the museum. And actually, it was such a turnaround that there was a lot of artists who, who depicted this moment, be it in photographs or in, uh, or in paintings. And they kind of used the Last Supper, the Last Supper uh, uh, model because for them, it was something was really changing. That was a new era in wine. So now that I introduced New World, we will go to the States and let's go. So the US, the US is, is a very big country, as you know. I will be talking about Napa Valley, but you have almost everywhere in the States, uh, all the regions are making wine. But first of all, let's do some history. I think we all grew up thinking that it was Christoph Columbus, the first European who set foot on in the Americas, where actually he wasn't. It was this guy called Leif Erikson, like the phone, not related to the phone. And he was a Viking and he was, I mean, him and his men were the first European ever to set foot in the Americas. And actually they called this country Vinland, very simply because wherever they looked, they had vines, wild vines growing everywhere. But that was in 1000. 500 years later, Christoph Columbus arrived. And when the emigrants arrived and European emigrants arrived to, to this part of the world, they started on the right of your screen. They, were, they started on the East Coast. But the problem is they wanted to make wine. But the problem first, they, they started using the, the wild vines they found, but they weren't good. They were giving like foxy, molded taste. These were the wild grape varieties in the States, in the, in the Americas. They weren't good. It was a different species of the grape variety they found in Europe. Then they brought their own grape varieties from Europe, but they, they didn't really survive on the East Coast. I won't go into technical details, but there was too much humidity. And more important, there was this very, very, very small insect eating at, eating at the roots of, of, those, uh, of those vines. And for those who know a little bit about wine, that was phylloxera. I won't go into this. But the West Coast, the West Coast was a different thing. People started going to the West Coast. Spanish coming up from Mexico went to California. California was, uh, was, uh, was a part of Mexico back then. And they started planting, they started planting uh, grapes, one called Mission grapes, which you can still find actually today in the States, not a very good grape. And they started making wine. But then this guy came, Agostón Horosti, and the reason, the reason I'm putting this guy is because he's considered as the father of, of winemaking in the, in the States. But I've put his biography because if any one of you is kind of these days thinking, what did I do in my life and did I do enough? I recommend you don't read his biography because this guy finished his laws, his Second, yeah, he finished his law degree, got enrolled in the Austrian Imperial Guard, reached colonel rank, the Hungarian, Hungarian viceroy, married a Polish countess, started the Silk Work Farm, got engaged in the independence movement. In the States, on the Americas, on the East Coast, he established stores, farms, 
a shipping company, a contracting company, went to San Diego, bought land, opened a horse renting company, butcher shops, became the sheriff of the town, became the gold minting institute director of San Francisco, and much more. But the most important thing he did, at least for us, was that he went to Europe and bought 100,000 vines, 300 different species. He brought it back to California, and this is really the start of the California winemaking. Just be before I leave this slide, if you want to know what happened to this guy, he got bored of the US, went to Nicaragua to invest in rum and wood factories, and was last seen falling in a crocodile infested river. An end that suits such an adventurer. Another thing that was very important in the States was prohibition. So I don't know why, at one point in 1920s, they decided that drinking alcohol is not good. So it completely, it killed, it killed the, the winemaking, the, the instituted, uh, the, the, the big producers of wine. And actually you had such, such advertising that lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. I think that was a counterproductive advertising when I see those who are saying this message. But you know, it's the state, it's marketing, it's how to abide by the law, but doing something else. So what they did is they launched something called the Vino Sano Grape Brick. This brick was, uh, how would you say, un um, condensé of grape that you would put in water, definitely for medicinal purposes, and then on it there was like this huge warning as what not to do. And the instructions were, after dissolving the brick in a gallon of water, do not place the liquid in a jug away in the cupboard for 20 days, because then it would turn into wine. And even they had a technician coming to your house to tell you what not to do in order to get wine. So this is why, how for 12 years, 13 years, Americans were drinking wine. At one point, it ended, and that was the revival of the new industry of winemaking in the States. California, Napa Valley. Today, when you think about the States, you think about Napa. And Napa is here where you have this red arrow. It's just near San Francisco. It's, it's kind of, it's a small, it's a small area. It's here, it's a very small area, but it's making today some of the best, not always the best wine, but some of the best wines in, in the States. And it has a very, very particular climate because California is hot and Napa is hot. But this is San Francisco. And for those of you who went there, you know that fog is, is something you almost see every day in San Francisco. So fogs come every day from the, from the Bay of San Francisco and goes over the vineyard in Napa Valley. So what happens is, even though it's a very hot country, half of the day you don't have the sun rays on the vines, you have half of day with the fog, so it gives more ripeness to the grapes. And this is one of the answer of the magic behind Napa Valley's wine. Napa is, is one of the most beautiful regions in the world. This is what you can see if you go there. It's valleys. It's almost like Tuscany. Uh, but it's also the state, so you will find beautiful artwork uh, all, over the, all over the vineyards. This is a 10-meter-high rabbit, stainless steel rabbit. But because it's the states, I don't know if you already saw that it's having a lightsaber carrying a lightsaber because they were launching Star Wars in, in the States. Okay, so Napa is the States. One thing to say about Napa that's extremely impressive is the unity they had. You know, 
they really started making wine in the 50s and 60s. And they knew if they're going to keep, compete between each other, they will never make it. So I've never seen winemakers work together as much as they work in, in Napa. In Napa, there's no secret. In Napa, if you have a problem with your wine, you call your neighbor, you tell him, and if you, if you can find a cure for your wine, he will. And working together, it was exponential. And this is how Napa, within 30, 40 years, is placed on the wine making map of the world with very expensive wines. Two grape varieties are very important in, uh, in Napa. Again, you have so many more, but the most important is Cabernet Sauvignon. And Cabernet Sauvignon is this very important grape variety in Bordeaux. It's, it's very lush. You have black cherry, black currant, like cedar, you can say it's like a tobacco box uh, with very high tannins. So tannins are, are what you really, what you have in your mouth, like something that dries your mouth, but is the sign of, of big wines. And Cabernet really found a very good place in, in, in Napa. And you can have some of the best Cabernet Sauvignon in the world. Another, another grape variety, which is very well known in the States, is called Zinfandel. And Zinfandel is, if you never lived in the States, you, you don't know Zinfandel, but if you live there, you know very well Zinfandel or Zin, how it's called. And Zinfandel is this grape variety that can make rosé, that can make white, that can make also red. It's less tannin, very much strawberries, blackberry, peach. It's a very seductive grape variety that can make really entry range wine or magnificent wines. So if you're in California drinking a Californian Cabernet, what would you eat? Well, though, this is one of those slides where vegetarians are not really favored because with, with a very bold wine like Cabernet, you're going to really want a very good piece of meat or some briskets, or if you really insist, some portobello mushrooms because it's very meaty. And the meat and the proteins in the meat are going to go incredibly well with the, uh, uh, with the uh, tannins of the Cabernet. So that was the States. Let's move to another very important region. Argentina. Argentina is probably one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I would, I would keep the, the adjective of the most beautiful to New Zealand, but definitely Argentina is one of the most beautiful regions, uh, countries in the world. Argentina is a very long country. So it starts it start halfway through South America, going to almost the start of the Antarctica. And it goes from 20 parallel latitude up to 55. That's a very, very long country. Just to give you an idea, Lebanon is one parallel between 33 and 34. Argentina is between 20 and 55. And all across this country, you have here between Argentina and Chile, you have the Andes mountain, the Andes mountain range. And this is, the Andes are what make winemaking possible in Argentina. Because Argentina is a, Argentina is a, is a hot country, again, not all of it, not in the south, is a hot country, but what it needs is the cooling effect that comes from the Andes mountain, and more importantly, it's a dry country. So they need the water that gathers, the snow water that gathers in the winter. They need it in the summer if they want to have any, any, any viable uh, vine making. So the, those who really planted Argentina were the same Spanish that came from Mexico. So they also planted the same variety, the Mission variety. Here it's called something else. But then this guy who was in this very happy looking guy, Faustino Sarmiento, was exiled to Chile. 
and then came back to came back to Argentina, had this dream of making their own agriculture national society, and that was founded on April 17th. I'm saying this because if you were ever invited by the embassy, the Argentinian embassy, to the Malbec World Day, if you've ever seen Malbec World Day, it's celebrated on the 17th April because of that. And actually, he ended up becoming a president of, of Argentina, but he came back and convinced a French guy, Michel Aimé Pouget, to come back with him, and he brought Malbec. He brought Malbec, this grape variety that is today the signature grape variety of Argentina. They brought it back with them, with him, and that was really the start of the story of winemaking in uh, modern winemaking in Argentina. You know, Argentina had a lot of problems. Argentina in the Argentina in the 1920s was one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Then the depression happened in the, in the States and it definitely influenced a lot what was happening in Argentina. And Argentina almost never recovered from, from this. But back then there was a lot of wine happening, a lot of wine being exported. So they did have, they did have a very important wine tradition. But actually, they needed to wait till the 1990 to have a revival of this, of this winemaking tradition. And we get this guy, who's actually more smiling than the other guy. And this guy is Nicolas Catena. For those of you who might know Argentinian wine, uh, Catena is, is a very important name. And this guy decided that he didn't want to do any more bulk wine. Argentina was known for bulk wine. He said, no, I want to do something high end. So he sold almost everything the family had, all the wine, all the bulk wine business, and really started focusing on making high end wines and started focusing on Malbec. And back then, everyone thought he was completamente loco. He was completely crazy because no one was focusing on Malbec. He made the Malbec, released that wine in the 1990s, and the world discovered Malbec, and the world discovered some of the best wines you can ever make, and Argentina was put on the wine map of the world. One of the most important region in, uh, in Argentina is Mendoza. And Mendoza is somewhere here, halfway, halfway between, halfway, uh, I mean, halfway the country. And Mendoza is around 1,000 uh, in terms of altitude. Argentina does have the highest altitude vines in the world. They can reach up to 3,000. Okay, the, the, the world record was broken by, by a vineyard in China, 3,500. But in terms of really the majority of vineyards, Argentina has the highest in the world. And Mendoza is there. Mendoza needs, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, uh, region. Uh, you see the Andes, all the water comes from the, from the Andes. The cooling effect comes from the Andes. Uh, by the way, a lot of the pictures you're going to see are are things taken by friend or take or from the internet. Some were taken by me. I'm not going to give credit every time, but this was this was taken by a very well known UK wine expert called Tom Canada. You can see a lot of a lot of horses in Argentina, and you see them between the rows, uh, the, the rows of the vines of Malbec. And Malbec, I totally invite you to try Malbec. It's, it's a red, but it's a big, bold wines without really the tannins that the Cabernet can have. It has a medium acidity. It has great red plum, blackberry, vanilla coming from the oak. Malbec can be 
Malbec can make some of the best wines in the world. And I know some friends, a UK lady and a Colombiano who, was, who are now in UK drinking a Malbec. I hope they are enjoying it. Another signature grape variety in Argentina is Torontes. Torontes. And Torontes is, you won't find Torontes outside Argentina. Torontes is, is a crossing between, between uh, Musca and another grape variety. So it's very, we call it a muscaty. It's very aromatic, rose petal. If you ever drank a Wurstraminer in Alsace, it's something like that. You have a medium acidity. It's an extremely refreshing white wine and something, I'm not sure you're going to find in Lebanon, but if you're ever traveling somewhere else to UK, you're definitely going to find Torontes. I invite you to try it. What would you eat with those? Again, Argentina, big, bold wines. Argentina is some of the best meat in the world. But again, it has this, it has this sweetness. It doesn't have sugar, but it has this sweetness. And with the sweetness, you can try, for example, a blue cheeseburger. You can try some lamb with some herbs. Malbec has this herbal side to it, would go very well with herbs. And with Torontes, when a white wine is very aromatic, it goes very well with anything that is spicy, Thai food. Uh, yeah, the aromas and the acidity goes very well with such food. Third country. South Africa. South Africa is is an extremely interesting country. South Africa really merges the old and the new. It's one of the oldest winemaking countries in the world and actually the oldest new world winemaking country. It's modern, but in the same time, it's very traditional. It had a very turbulent history. It was, it was colonized by the Dutch. Then they planted vines in 1650. So it's a long tradition. But really what put South Africa on the map was this wine, Vin de Constance, Constancia. That was a sweet wine made in South Africa and drank in all the royal courts of Europe. All the emperor and king, kings wanted this wine. There, it was always put on the same level as Tokai and Sauterne in Bordeaux. And probably the most famous fan of this wine is this guy, Napoleon. And it seems that there's archives about this, that when Napoleon was exiled on St. Helena, he was getting 30 bottles of vin de Constance per month. So one bottle per day. What did they do in months which had 31 days? We don't know. And actually, and this is not true, a friend of mine who's a winemaker in South Africa told me, did you, I cannot do the accent, the South African accent, but did you ever wonder why every single picture painting of Napoleon and Elena, St. Helene, was looking at the sea? Because he was waiting for the shipping of his vin de Constance. I, I'm not sure that's true, but that's the, that's the story. But 20th century was extremely hard for South Africa. They had tariffs with the UK and the UK changed those tariffs so they couldn't really sell their wines. Then there was apartheid, a lot of problem, no export. It's only after the apartheid that they really started reinventing themselves. And I think it's slightly an injustice when I'm going only to talk about one or two grape varieties because South Africa makes around 10, 15 great grape varieties. All the grape varieties you know about are being made today in South Africa and are done in a very good way. But their two signature grape varieties are one called, uh, one called uh, the most known is Pinotage, 
and a white grape variety called Chenin Blanc. Stellenbosch is, this is, I mean, South Africa is big, but again, it's only the tip making wine. And again, it's a hot country. So what they need is they need cooling effect. And this cooling effect is going to come from the sea. Stellenbosch is next to the sea, but it's really next to the Cape Mountain range. And you have this cooling effect coming from the mountains. And in the same time, you have the cooling effect coming from the ocean. It's not very far from the Antarctica. Pinotage. Pinotage is something you're not going to, you're not going to get outside, outside South Africa or very little. It's somewhat controversial grape variety. Some people love it. And some people say this is the best grape variety we can have for, we can have for South Africa some, and some hate it. Why? Because it's a grape variety when you really want to make big yield, big volumes. And this is what South Africa was doing in the 20th century. When you want to make big volumes, it's not going to be good. It's going to have something like a wet paint, something like, um, a varnish smell to it and it's not really agreeable but when it's done in a good way it's black sherry it's blackberry it's medium tannins and if anyone is interested to know where the name pinotage comes from very simply it's a crossing between pinot noir from burgundy and Sanso, Sanso is very big in Lebanon. We have Sanso in Lebanon, but Sanso used to be called long time ago Hermitage. So when they crossed those two varieties, they called Pinotage. And this is how we have Pinotage. Chenin Blanc is, is a very well known grape variety in the world. It's, it's in the Loire, it's in Australia, you have it a lot. But really, South Africa masters wine making with Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc has this superb acidity, zingy acidity, like yellow apple, quince, pear. It can be done sweet, it can be done dry. Again, if you can put your hand on a Chenin Blanc from, uh, from South Africa, don't hesitate. What to eat? Well, with Pinotage, you can go to meat, which are kind of lean, chicken, sausages, because the tannins are not that hard. With a pizza, a good pizza, a good traditional pizza is going to be very good with a, with a pinotage. And then with the chenin, everything you can think about when it comes from the sea, tartare, as long as it has some lemon, it would go very well with the acidity of, of the chenin. Now, Australia. Well, how to, how to summarize Australia in five minutes? Australia is big. Australia is, is a continent, actually. And some people say Australia is the France of the New World. And it's 14 times bigger than France. But why they say this? You have such a diversity of climate, such a diversity of soils, of region, that you can almost recreate any kind of wine any kind of wine you want. Australia, the first settlement were done in 1788. They started making wine. Then you had the gold rush. So you had so many people coming there, trying to get gold in Australia. And then at one point they couldn't find gold. So they started making wine. And this is why it's so scattered everywhere, especially in Victoria region. It's scattered everywhere. And all the southern tip of Australia is making wine today because this is the coolest, this is the coolest region. So the whole continent of Australia is not making wine. It's only this, this region here, but this is extreme. This is very, very big. And who's that guy? James Busby, this very nice smiley guy is the father of, of the Australian, uh, Australian winemaking. In a viticultural diplomat, which took a ship from Scotland, came, came to Australia, had with him on the ships 
hundreds of thousands of, uh, of plants. And he was really obsessed. And during the month or the month journey, he kept those plants alive until he got there and started planting these everywhere. And he got the best species from Europe. And really, he's at the heart of, of the winemaking. Another guy, a little bit more smiley, I'm not going to give you his family name, he's called Christopher, because some of you who might know the Australian wines, if I give them the family name, they would recognize him. That's, this guy was a doctor. And one thing he did was prescribe to his patients with whatever remedies he would prescribe, he would prescribe one glass of wine. And at one point he realized that his patients were actually coming back, not for the remedies, but for the wine. So he understood, okay, something is going, something is going here. And what he did is actually stopped being a doctor and started making wine. And his family name was Penfold. For those of you who know a little bit Australian wines, Penfold is the most important name, the biggest producer in Australia, and more importantly, is making the signature wine of Australia, Penfold Grange. If you ever had this wine, you're lucky, and it's one of the best wines in the world. I only chose Barossa Valley. Again, Australia is so big, but I chose Barossa Valley. And Barossa Valley is here on this, uh, on this tip. And it's actually a little bit away from the sea. So it's in the mountains, again, cooling influence. And this is where they plant Shiraz. Shiraz is Syrah, the Syrah you have in France, but they call it in Australia Shiraz, not related to the, to the, to the, city, in, to the city in Iran. And Syrah is really found a very good, a very good place for it to, to be, uh, uh, to be transformed into into wine in uh, in in Barossa. So when you go to Barossa, you're going to find these. These are not just for the picture opportunity. Uh, kangaroos are always there. Sometimes they eat the grapes. It's really like Tuscany. It's rolling hills after hills, and they are known for the Shiraz. And Shiraz is is an explosion of fruit in the new world. You have a little bit of pepper, you have blueberry. The tannins are not very harsh. It's a very seductive grape varieties. And, and it's, I mean, one of the best grape variety you can find in, you can find in Australia. What to eat with Syrah or Shiraz, Australian Shiraz. Again, a good roast beef, Australians are very, very well known for their barbecues. And if you really want to eat cheese with it, go for a Gouda that is, uh, that is aged. And our last country today is going to be New Zealand. New Zealand is, is really next to really next to, to Australia, but actually it's very far. When you get to Australia, when you're flying, you think, oh, I'm, I'm above Australia. I'm going to get to New Zealand very soon. It takes you seven hours when you get over Australia just to reach New Zealand. It's for me one of the most beautiful countries in the world, if not the most beautiful country in the world. New Zealand is about the Maori culture, it's about rugby, the old black, and is probably some of the best hiking you can do in the world. It's a young country. They define themselves as the youngest country in the world. And because it was only settled in the 1200s by the Maoris, the Maoris weren't, weren't farmer, so the land was never farmed until 200 years ago by the settlers. You remember this guy, James Busby? He tried to make, he tried to bring grape varieties from Australia and do the same thing in New Zealand. It didn't really work because he was a diplomat. And the British asked him to make a treaty, a peace treaty, independence treaty with the Maori. He tried actually, but 
let's say that back then the UK was a little bit more ruthless when it and when when it meant making treaties than today, and they kind of tricked the Maori, and it didn't really go well. There was war, and actually the whole heritage of of James Busby was destroyed. New Zealand was is two islands actually and not very creatively called the Northern Ireland and the Southern Ireland. And really the guy who, who pushed the wine, the, the New Zealand wine on the, uh, on the international scene is this guy, David Honnen. He's actually a New Zealand guy, winemaker, but who was in Australia. At one point, New Zealand winemakers came to him in Australia to taste his wine. And just before leaving, they said that that was in the 1980s. They said, hey, would you like to try some of our wines? He said, yeah, why not? Leave it there. And when they left, he tasted and actually found something incredible. He was flabbergasted. He was tasting Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. He went back, started Cloudy Bay, and Cloudy Bay is the biggest name in the winemaking in New Zealand. And it put Sauvignon Blanc on the map. And he planted it in a region called Marlborough, not related to the cigarettes. And Marlborough, again, is probably one of the nicest regions in the world. You see this, you see mountains, you see lakes, you see the sea. You have so much wildlife. If you look at those netting above the vineyards, this is because you have so many birds that come and eat the grapes, so they have to net uh, the vineyards. And Sauvignon Blanc, once you taste Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, you will never forget it. It's gooseberry, it's grapefruit, it's white peach. If, if someone is drinking Sauvignon Blanc in a room and you enter, you're going to know he's drinking Sauvignon Blanc. It's so aromatic, so pungent, very nice acidity. Try, try Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. And what would you eat with that? You would eat definitely mussels, anything coming from the sea, a very grilled fish with some lemon and if you really want to be sophisticated a raspberry goat salad and i will end today with this maori proverb and i won't try to read it in in maori but the translation is from the cradle to the grave we are forever learning thank you thank you thank you very much mr kahali i think it is now time for our little poll or little survey. I'm waiting for the slides to appear on the screen. Okay. I think we will give a few seconds to all of you to type the answer on the screen. So the question is, which New World winemaking country would you be interested in knowing about and tasting its wine? You can have a multiple choice here. Okay, a few seconds more. Okay, I think it's good. We can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, so the question, the question will be, the, the, the results of the survey will be given at the end of the, of the session. I will start with the first question, Mr. Kahali. Thanks again for the very interesting and fascinating uh, presentation. The first question of today is a good one. Um, what, oh, how do you think that vegetarian, vegetarianism and veganism and the no meal movement will impact the wine world in the future? I, I, I don't think it will really impact the, in terms of consumption, very simply because the fact is today I was talking about very tannic wine. So tannic wine means usually meat, but you can also eat some, some proteins which are coming from vegetables. But we shouldn't forget that wine is white wine, is rosé, is Pinot Noir coming from Burgundy, which can go very well with non-meat food. So I think it's wine is such a big array 
it's not going a problem. What I'm seeing, the influence is not on eating or drinking. I'm seeing the influence of in winemaking because some of the products that used to be used 20, 30 years ago had some animal protein in it, something you would put in the wine. Nothing will, nothing will, will, will still be in the wine when you put it in the bottle, but you use it during winemaking. And, and people didn't want that. So 20, 30 years ago, everyone switched, not using any more of those that we don't use anymore. Uh, egg white, we used to use egg white to find wine. So we don't use that. And now there's this, this movement toward getting certified as vegan, as vegan wine. I mean, certification is good, but I can tell you that 80 or 90% of the wines in the world is vegan today, even though it's not certified. So I'm seeing the impact more on the production than on the consumption. Thank you very much for this very precise answer. Question number two, uh, what do you think about the wines from, from Uruguay, Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil? Do they also have something to offer, something interesting to offer in terms of wine? Definitely, definitely. When, when you talk Uruguay and Peru, these regions, they were making wine very long time ago. What's happening today with Uruguay and what's happening with Peru is that they weren't really on the wine map of the world. And if we were doing this presentation in the 90s or 80s, we would be talking the same about New Zealand and Argentina. So these countries are, they are happening and they are doing some, some great wines. Brazil, I have a question mark. I mean, when you go near the tropical regions, let's say Brazil, let's say India, let's say Thailand, on the other side of the world, it's not easy. This is where you're starting pushing a little bit the vine in doing grapes in a region where it doesn't really, it's not really a natural habitat. Especially that with the climate warming, Today, our worries are about regions like Lebanon, worries are about regions like Australia. So really what will happen in a region like Brazil, which is already hot today and will become hotter? I mean, it's very interesting, but I think that if Brazil didn't have the tariff limitations and a wine pays something like 150% of custom duties, international wine to get into Brazil, if those tariffs didn't exist, I'm not sure Brazilian wine would exist. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also very interesting. Uh, in terms of wine, Lebanon is actually part of the old world, as you mentioned in the first slide of your presentation. Um, and we have a warm climate. So why do the Lebanese wine producers try to replicate a Bordeaux wine finally? Uh, shouldn't we learn something from the new world and adapt the production to get something more exciting, something less traditional? Hallelujah. Thank you. That's a good, and that's a good question. I will try to answer it within less than two hours. Yes, it's true. Uh, Lebanon is, has a very long tradition in winemaking. We've been making wine for 6,000 years, and we know that. There was an interruption during the Ottoman Empire, but people think that it was done for religious reasons. Not at all. It was done for taxes reasons. The Ottoman Empire wanted taxes, and they were heavily taxing wine. So people started doing some, um, some smuggling, and they switched to Arak. It was much easier to, to hide Arak. And actually, the soldiers, the Ottoman soldiers, preferred Arak over wine. So this is why kind of during 400 years, wine disappeared. So I'm saying this, so yes, Lebanon is an old world. But when it started again, it was with Jesuits, it was with French. And you know very well how much Lebanese we are, we're attached to mother France. And when we thought about wine, we were thinking about France, about Bordeaux. Every single winemaker from the older generation 
went to study in Bordeaux. Every French expert we got making wine was coming from Bordeaux. So this is why we ended up making, trying to replicate Bordeaux. And actually, in the past 10, 15 years, the young generation said enough is enough. I mean, Bordeaux grapes can be great. Syrah can be great in Lebanon. But let us try to find our own heritage. And my question is always, what is our Malbec? What is the Malbec of Lebanon? And what can we do to really deserve our place on the wine map of the world? Monsieur le Consul, je vous entends pas. Oui. Oh, sorry, sorry. I had a small technical uh, problem yeah. here, but it's okay. Uh, the next question is very simple. In terms of uh, volume, in terms of total amount of sold bottles in the world, finally, who has the first place? Is it the new world or the old world? Oh, no, it's, it's the old world. Uh, in terms of volume, uh, it's always a competition between Spain and Italy. And depending on who has a better harvest and whatever, it's Spain or Italy. Whereas the French are always third in terms of volume, but they are big first, big champions when it comes to value because they sell, they sell uh, very expensive wines. But today, you have countries like, like Argentina, like Chile, growing and growing more. The really very interesting here is China. China didn't exist 15 years ago in terms of wine. And one day they decided that, you know what, we need to start pushing people to drink wine because when you drink wine, you have less probability of having alcoholic problems. So let's switch from hard spirits to wine. And they really started pushing wine. And today, China is the fifth producer of of wine in the world. No one knows about this. But today everything is being sold within China. And if one day they start selling their wine outside their borders, they can become very quickly number two or number three in the world, if not number one. Mm. A very practical question uh, asked by one of our attendees. How long can you keep a white wine, a white wine sorry, in the fridge? I guess once it's opened. And also what red and white wine would you recommend for a vegetarian diet? Okay, uh, the first part is much simpler to, to, to answer. Uh, you know, the white wine, you don't need the skin of, of the grape to make white wine. You need the skin of a red wine, uh, in the red grape to make red wine, very simply because the color comes from the skin. When you're extracting the color, in a red wine, you're also extracting something called the tannins. And the tannins are actually the antioxidants of the wine. So they protect the wine against oxygen. So when you're, when you're having a white wine, white wine doesn't really have tannins and it doesn't really have a natural protection against oxygen. So once you open a white bottle, you better drink it fast. A very good thing to do is, you know, you can, you can buy those pumps, it's nothing, it's like 20,000 or 30,000 liras. It's something that you pump the air out and you keep it in the fridge and it will keep for two, three days. But usually white wines are not made to be kept a lot and especially not in a, once it's open. Okay, vegan. Uh, it depends what you're eating with. It, it has nothing to do with vegan. If, if you're eating some proteins, some, something that's really sticking in your mouth, on your tongue, on your palate, you can, you can match it with wines which are a little bit bold with some tannins. But if you're only eating vegetables without a lot of proteins or actually protein you can feel, then all the area of the white or the rosé wines are going to go very well. So the better question would have been, if I'm eating particularly this, what would I drink with it? Okay. I, I apologize in advance for my next question because your presentation was about, about travel, about love, about almost poetry. But I'm going to speak about money. Uh, yes. I know more and more people who buy uh, expensive bottles 
but they never drink it because they consider this as a pretty good investment. So my question is very simple. Do you think that buying bottles of wine is a good investment strategy? Okay, should I answer as the webinar uh, panelist or as someone who wants to sell wine? I let you choose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, look, wine is a good investment. It's not gold mine, but it's a good investment. But if you're, I actually had to answer this to someone who was asking me this few days ago. If, if you're going to buy wine on the sole purpose of, of investing and of selling again those bottles, do it through a professional, do it through a fund. You can buy funds, check Life X 50, Life X 100, on the internet, these are funds buying the 100 best wines in the world, and you can buy shares and, and get out whenever you want, like any other like any other fund. But I would recommend if you're buying wine, because from time to time you're going to open the case and enjoy one of the bottles or two or three, and maybe one day sell the rest, then yes. It becomes a very good investment because it's bringing you endless pleasure, but at the same time, it's something that you can sell. But 100% investment, watch out, because you have some Bordeaux being bought and then they take 30, 40, 50, or 100% uh, uh, value and some other Bordeaux that you can, I mean Bordeaux and other, other regions in the world that you can buy and you will get a 20 or 30% loss two years later. Thank you. Um, next question. Considering saint -Sau is uh, doing well actually in Lebanon, I mean, uh, fits well uh, in Lebanon. Have any producers considered pinotage in Lebanon, planting pinotage in Lebanon? Or is it no. just reserved for South Africa, finally? Not to my, uh, not to my, uh, I never heard someone planting pinotage in Lebanon. Uh, but don't forget that Senso does well in uh, Senso does well in hot countries, and actually the Jesuits brought Senso from southern France, and Senso was also planted in Algeria and Morocco. So it's a great variety that goes very well with it can adapt to heat. Whereas the other side of the equation here, the Pinotage is the Pinot Noir. And this side of the equation doesn't really like heat. Uh, Pinot thrives well in the very cold countries, in, in, in Burgundy, in the southern uh, tip of, of the southern island in, um, uh, in uh, New Zealand. So I'm not sure Pinotage would, be, would do very well in the heat of, of Lebanon, but Senso is definitely uh, something interesting and more and more young winemakers are trying to do some very good sensor. Okay, thank you. We have a lot of questions popping up. Unfortunately, we will not have time to ask them all. I think we have time for one or two additional questions. The next one is very short. What about iced wines? What do you think about iced wines? Oh, iced wine are, are great. If, if, if you see the, if you, if you remember the first slides I, I've shown you the, about the map, there was also green on Canada. And Canada is very well known about ice wine. In two words, what is ice wine? Ice wine is something, is grapes you're going to pick when you have snow and when you have frost. So this happens in November or December in Canada. And because of this frost, What's going to happen is that the inside of the grape variety is going to freeze. But if you remember a little bit about chemistry when we we're at school, the water is going to freeze first and the sugar is not going to freeze. So you freeze it, it freezes naturally, and then you press it. So actually what you're going to get, first of all, is this very concentrated sugary juice. And actually the water is going to be thrown away just as ice. So you're going to get a juice that is extremely concentrated as extremely sugary. And this is what you use to make wine. And this is what you call ice wine. And it can be, it can be very good. Okay. Uh, it will be, unfortunately, our last question for today. 
Um, where do Lebanese wines stand amongst the wines you mentioned today? Finally, is the Lebanese winemaking a mature uh, winemaking uh, area or market? W without, without any hesitation, yes. Uh, you know, we, as Lebanese, we have always this tendency of looking at the best in other countries and looking at the worst in our country. And we sometimes, not everyone, sometimes we snob our local, our local production. Lebanese wine are, can be great. 50 years ago, I, I'm not sure it would be the same answer, but so much was done in the past 20, 30 years. Everyone is pushing everyone up and up. So the quality today is great. The price, the price, quality ratio when you buy in Lebanon is great. The one thing we really still need to find is this very precise identity you were talking about, Monsieur le Consul, is what grape variety and how to do it. What is the identity of Lebanese wine? But in terms of quality, it's one of the best winemaking countries in the world. Mr. Kahali, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. It was really a breath of fresh air. Um, I'm very happy. I am pretty sure the attendees are all thirsty and hungry now, but I think we, sh we still have time to show the results of our little survey. And then I will leave the floor at the end to our president for the, for the closing remarks. So we can switch to the next slide to show the results of the survey. Here we go. So as you can see, the number one Great. is New Zealand. New Zealand is, is it a good choice? Are you, do you agree with that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And look, it is far. It takes 21, 22 hours for anyone who can go there. It's the nicest countries, the nicest country on this planet. Thank you so much. I now leave the floor to Antoine Caldani for the closing remarks. Well, thank you, uh, Monsieur le Consul, and thank you, Harry, for this breathtaking Tour du Monde in 60 minutes. It has been a very refreshing and informative session. A much needed getaway in light of our local four day lockdown ahead. I would like to thank all the participants for joining us today. You were more than 300 to register. Uh, a big thank you to the members of the admin committee for the great work they have been doing lately. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, rendez-vous la semaine prochaine avec Maître Karim Dahel, fiscaliste et président de l'ALBIC. Karim nous parlera des outils disponibles pour la lutte contre la corruption. Until then, stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good evening. Au revoir. Ciao, ciao.